Point du Sable, who in the 1700s was a free black man of Haitian descent, moved up to this area in the 1780s and built a homestead for himself and started a trading post where the Apple Store is today, becoming the first non-indigenous resident of Chicago. But people have been living here for a long time, primarily from the Council of Three Fires, the Ottawa, the Ojibwe, and the Potawatomi tribes. Chicago actually gets its name from a Potawatomi word. Chicago is derivative of Chicago, which is Potawatomi for land of the stinky onion. <laughs> what Chicago means, take that big apple, we are a stinky onion. That is because the stinky onions that used to grow along this river. This was a swampland before there was a city. It probably had a smell. But this river is all natural in its color. It's not dyed. It's only dyed on St. Paddy's Day. And that dye only lasts for about a day or two. So this green color is from the algae in the water. But we've had a nice little introduction to Chicago. Let's get into some architecture. It's my great honor to introduce you to the third tallest building in Chicago on this left-hand side. It is the St. Regis Tower, the Blue Glass Beauty. Built just two years ago, part residence, part hotel. Six different colors of blue glass getting lighter as it gets wider. More importantly, St. Regis Tower is the world's tallest building designed by a female-led architecture firm, Jeannie Gang of Studio Gang. Very excited to have her work in our city. A little bit about Jeannie Gang. She was Chicago, Chicago land born and raised. She went to Harvard, and in 2011, she won the MacArthur Genius Grant through those two floors. A deceptively simple way to eliminate a lot of drift. The only trouble, it's a pretty expensive option. A two-floor penthouse sold for $18.5 million in the St. Regis Tower. They're losing out on a lot of money, but hey, you gotta do what you gotta do to build a tall, tall building in a windy, windy city. Well, let's look on this left-hand side. We will see a blue building in the shape of a triangle. This is the Swiss Hotel built in 1989 designed by an architect of the name of Harry Weiss. All you need to know about him is that he likes triangles and he trains playing triangles in all of his buildings. We'll see some of his work a little bit later on. That they warned you. was the horn, if you're wondering. <laughs> Just let people know. We are on the way. But let's look behind that triangle-shaped building. In the second row, we will see a blue glass building with one patio is all around it. This is Aqua Tower, completed in 2009. It was formerly the world's tallest building, designed by a female-led architecture firm. Genie Gang of Studio Gang's work, once again. Notice how it looks like a cascading waterfall or a crashing wave. It's because of those white patios. Curiously enough, those white patios are actually geometrically unique. No two patio is exactly the same. Um, Aqua Tower, this is to maximize the amount of porches with sunlight. You want each patio to have a little bit of sunlight. That's how they're able to do it in the tower. But let's look at this right hand side. We'll see a beige building with a yellow dome on the top of it. This is the Intercontinental Hotel. Originally built in 1929, it was the Men's Shriners Athletic Club. And that yellow dome was originally blimp parking. So the idea is you would ride your blimp into town, park your blimp there, get your workout done with your fellow Shriners blimp back home. They never took advantage of the idea. The Hindenburg, the Hindenburg disaster happened and nobody wanted to be on a blimp anymore. But if you look on this right hand side, you'll notice a cream building that looks like a wedding cake with a clock tower at the top there. This is the Wrigley building. Completed in the 1920s, it was built in a style called Spanish Revivalist, which is an offshoot of European Revivalist styles. This is when American architects were looking across the pond in Europe for the tried and true standards of beauty. This is because America didn't have its own sense of beauty. It had its own styles, it just didn't have its own standard of beauty. So they would then copy those castles, copy those cathedrals, revive them by pasting them in America. 
which again, with the Wrigley Building, it's based off a cathedral in Seville, Spain, and there's 250,000 terracotta tiles on the Wrigley Building, and six different colors of cream, creating that soft mosaic effect. These tiles are actually so delicate, they have to be hand washed each year. There's no power washing for the entire Wrigley oh, Building, quite the task indeed. Damn. A little bit about Wrigley Company. This is the Wrigley Chewing Gum Company that commissioned this building. You can find their name on the field where the Chicago Cubs play on the north side of Chicago, Wrigley Field. But we're jumping nearly 90 years in the future to the second tallest building in Chicago. We're about to see the Trump International Hotel and Tower built in a style we're going to be talking a lot about today called contextualism. Contextualism. This is an architectural style that involves building buildings that are in conversation with its context. Contextualist buildings want to fit in rather than stand out. This tower is able to do this with these three patios or setbacks. They all have corresponding heights with buildings in the area. This first setback, this matches the roof of the Wrigley building, as we just discussed. The second terrace, that matches the roof of the white rocket ship building across the river, the Mather Tower. And that third setback, that matches the big black box behind Trump Tower, the AMA Plaza. So that's how this tower is in conversation with its context. Apartments on the cover of the Wilco album. It was somewhat of an urban experiment built in the 1960s at a time when no one was really living in this downtown area. It was a business district. You'd come down to your work, go back to the neighborhoods or suburbs where you lived. But an architect by the name of Bertrand Goldberg was looking to change things. He wanted to change the world that he lived in. And he wanted people to live and work in this downtown area like they did in European cities. But he knew in order to do this, he needed to add all the public amenities that you might have in daily life. And he did just that. He added the amenities right to the towers themselves. Whoa. These towers originally had convenience stores, retail shops, reverse. restaurants, a dry cleaner, office wow. space, <laughs> car parking, yacht parking, an ice skating rink, a bowling alley, a theater. Truly, what more do you need? Truly a city within a city. Introvert's dream. <laughs> and it is someone's job to valet park all of these cars. So quite the job indeed. But on this left-hand side, we will see it. the Chicago Riverwalk. Fairly recent addition to our Man, river. Completed in 2009, yeah. it's been bringing people down to the water like never before. Yeah. Bring people that close to it. They're working in the left hand side, completed in 1927. The right hand side, completed in 1987, 60 years apart. And yet these elements are still working in harmony with each other. That's what architects like to do in this city. They like to complement the heritage while also using modern materials and styles. Similar story with this bridge we're about to float under. Has a vintage look with those railings and those lamps. Well, this bridge was completed nine years ago. Almost exact replica of the bridge it replaced, built 91 years ago, revitalizing the history. No, no rust, no rust. That's right inside. We're about to see the massive merchandise mart. Completed 1930. This was the world's largest building at the time. 4.2 million square feet, you lay that all out, that's 73 football fields worth of space. <coughs> Built in an Art Deco style. Notice that Indiana limestone facade, those deep inset windows creating vertical lines that dry your eyes up towards a set back roof. This makes the building look taller than it actually is. It's indicative of this Art Deco style, which rose to prominence in the late 1920s, early 1930s. This is a time of American prominence. This is when the country had a lot of money. It's the Roaring Twenties. It's the Jazz Age. They're spending a lot of the mo this money on these buildings, making them really big because they're very often the case of the Chicago River. It's my great honor to welcome you to Wolf Point, the birthplace of the city of Chicago. Take it all in. Take it all in. In the 1830s, when the city was incorporated, you could find a tavern here and a couple trading posts. The city has only been getting bigger since. This is where all three river branches meet to Main Branch, North Branch, South Branch. But let's talk about this giant hot pocket shaped building right in front of us. A giant McDonald's apple pie box. Either way, 
Makes you hungry, two schools of thought. River Point building completed in 2017. Once you notice that parabolic arch on the bottom there, they were doing that because the River Point building is built over train tracks. Look at those circles in the white stone. Those are exhaust fans for the mm. train tracks. And since it couldn't build through the train tracks, they brought the foundation upwards and outwards in that nice arch there. Also, that red sculpture in front of the River Point building was designed by Santiago Calatrava, a famous designer and architect. He didn't design the building, but he did design the sculpture. And curiously enough, Santiago actually has a degree in architecture and a PhD in civil engineering. He combines these knowledges together to try to cap capture motion itself with static sculptures. I think he does a great job with this work at River Point Building. But we're talking about some history. Let's talk a little bit more about this peachy rectangular shaped building right in front of us. This is Fulton House. Built in 1898, it's going to be the oldest building we see on our tour today. While you're looking at it, it doesn't look there's like no windows and no balconies. It's just all brick because that's how it was originally completed. It was a refrigeration building for the meatpacking industry. Meatpacking used to be huge in the city of Chicago. That's how it got the nickname <laughs> the Hog Butcher of the World. Meat would be cut on the south side of Chicago, placed on a barge sent up to a building such as Fulton House to be frozen, placed on refrigerated train cars going across the country and occasionally the world. This was great into the 1970s when the meat packing industry left Chicago. And our good friend Harry Lee saw this building and said, hey, this might be a great place for 106 condominiums. To start the renovation process, he had to wait for the building to thaw. It took three months for this building. And thaw. They had to cut through three foot thick walls. Look at those balconies. That's how thick those walls originally were. And when they got into them, they were filled with horse hair and cork. <laughs> the popular insulation at the time. I used to work at Home Depot. You won't find horse hair and cork in the insulation aisles <laughs> anymore. Not where they're found. But Harry Weiss led the completion of these river cottages on the left hand side, these residential homes. There's the triangle that I was talking about. Harry Weiss was kind of considered a joke for building residential in the North Branch. Because at the time, the river was quite unpleasant. It was quite stinky. It wasn't something you wanted to be around. But Harry Weiss had the foresight to see that things might change. And they did. One of these river cottages recently sold for $2.2 million. Reflects a changing attitude the city has had towards its river. You see another road bridge, but they don't use it for railroad purposes anymore. But they bring it down once a year, just for a few minutes, just to make sure they still can, make sure they still got it in them. Similar to how I do a push-up once a year, just to make sure I still can. It's a giant block of concrete on the back side of this bridge. This is what holds the bridge up. It's a counterweight. All the bridges we'll see today have a counterweight somewhere. They usually just hide it underground. So, they're built in a style called Trinian Bascule. Bascule is French for seesaw. And it doesn't take as much horsepower as you might think to move these bridges. It only takes the horsepower of a 1950s Volkswagen bug to move the entire bridge. The parade for movie buffs on board. But let's look on the right hand side. You will see a blue glass building that looks like a Y on the bottom. Looks like an upside down wine bottle. This is 150 North Riverside. And it's built in a next gen contemporary style of architecture. This is a modern style that focuses on performance and innovation. And a little bit of sustainability, a lot of performance in this structure. Because this plot of land sat empty for 80 years. That's because there's a river on one side, train tracks on the other, leaving only 39 feet to build the base of this building. Jesus. They use something called caissons. Caissons can be thought of as concrete columns. They're about 12 feet in diameter. There's 12 of them. They start 120 feet down at bedrock, go all the way to the top of the structure. Start with a strong core, wrap the rest of the building around it. Wow. Believe it or not, they also use water tanks in this building. It's called inertial slosh dampers, the second part of our series, how to build tall buildings in windy, windy cities. So, 
Remember, the enemy is drift, the wind blowing our buildings around. We're doing this because in order to build on the river these days, you have to allow at least 30 feet of setback to continue the river walk. So the designers of the structure decided to vault that third floor at these tripod-like I-beams underneath to make it happen. I think these buildings look like modern-day iPhones. Sleek and elegant on the outside, but packed with cutting-edge technology on the inside. But we have a treat for everyone. We're about to float by five buildings built in chronological order right next to each other. It's gonna be a great visual demonstration of the evolution of architecture in Chicago, the country, and the world. You're gonna see five buildings on this right-hand side that reflect four different styles. This is a time machine. And our first stop is the year 1929. So we're about to float into Art Deco Canyon. We call it Art Deco Canyon because there's going to be Art Deco building flanking us from the left and right hand sides. We'll talk about the Civic Opera building a little bit later. But let's start with two North Riverside Plaza on this right hand side. Classic Art Deco. Notice that Indiana limestone facade. Those vertical lines drawing your eyes up towards a set back roof. Remember, this is a time of American prosperity. This is when the country has a lot of cash on hand to spend on these structures. And they're making them big because they're very optimistic about the future. But we're floating into black box modernism. See on this right-hand side, two black boxes. You might be thinking, hey, what happened? These are just plain boxes. What happened to all the extravagance and opulence of the Art Deco era? Well, it's because of two events. The first event, 1929, there was a stock market crash, which led to an extended economic disaster. The second event was World War II. These two events, watch out, led to no office buildings built between the years 1930 and 1957. When the country went back to building office buildings with gateway centers one and two in the 1960s, Things were different, priorities had changed. These were children of the Great Depression and were a lot more frugal than the Art Deco Gen right hand side. If you ask a child to draw you a building, it's probably gonna look similar to Gateway Center number three, completed in 1971. It's built in a style called International Style. It's called International Style because if you pick this building up and place it pretty much anywhere in the world, it's going to look similar to the buildings built in that time period. These were everywhere. These were wildly popular. This copy and paste. You probably have an international style building in your home town. Keep your eye out for that next time you're walking around. But when we're out from under this bridge, we're going to be floating into the 80s. This is when things actually got bonkers for buildings. This is the rise of site-specific designs. This is the rise of contextualism. See that with Gateway Center number four on this right hand side, the green building completed in 1983. Notice that curve mimics the curve of the river. That green pitch glass facade makes it look like just an upwards extension of the river, staying timeless by being in conversation with its context. But that concludes our little mini journey. Hope we've been able to see there's some pretty dramatic shifts throughout architecture's history and how these buildings are reflective of what was going on in these time periods and the feelings of these time periods. The break is where the building stands, the you are here marker for this map. And this building used to not get a lot of attention. It was just a plain black box. But for the handsome price of $800,000, you can add a map to the side of your building. Give a reason for people like me to talk about it. 300 South Wacker, we call it the map building. But fans of the film The Dark Knight, 2008 Batman movie, recognize this building on the right-hand side. This is the bank the Joker robs in the beginning of the film. This building never was a bank, though. It's the old Chicago post office. Built in 1932, it was the world's largest post office. They built the world's largest post office because of the mail-order catalog industry. Sears, Roebuck, and Ward were headquartered in the city. They built this massive post office 
to accommodate. Jesus Christ, that's a new this is great until 1996. The U.S. Postal Service moved to a smaller no, location. They didn't need a post office of such stature because mail order catalogs had fallen off the face of the earth. For 20 years, the building sat empty until 2016. A developing world's fair, the 1893 Columbian Exposition. This was a big deal. The city had to brag a lot. Might have bragged a little bit too much because two New York reporters wrote not bad saying, why should we give this fair to these prairie hillbillies? They're blowing hot air. They're talking wind. They're telling long-winded stories. And boom, from that moment forward, Chicago was known as the Windy City. First recorded use of that name. How the politicians used to boast about this town. But jokes on those two New York reporters because Chicago actually won the bid to host the 1893 World's Fair. Within nine months, under the supervision of Daniel Burnham, 200 plus structures were erected for this fair. They used white plaster to cover the these buildings. Uh, they used electricity on a killer. scale that had never been seen before to light the campus up. The white city was born on the south side of Chicago. Mike, for just a quick minute here, we're gonna see all those cool buildings we saw. Talk about all the ones we didn't. But Hop off the mic, can walk around, help you answer any questions you might have. We're getting some similar feelings to those two corn cops we saw earlier. Well, it's because it's designed by the same architect, Bertrand Goldberg. Those were the Marina City apartments. These are the River City apartments. It's the second attempt at a city within a city. See, apartments at the top, child care facility on the first floor, office space on the other side. Wouldn't be a city within a city without some yacht parking either. As a Chicago citizen, I'm constantly plagued by poor yacht parking. But fortunately, Bertrand's got my back. That's right inside. You'll notice that they're building a new building. This is a part of the Reed. This is going to be the Reed Residential Building, part of the Riverline development. It's part of a renaissance of people moving to the city and buildings popping up to accommodate to that. People want to live in the city is partly because there's a lot of workspaces moving to the city. You can look at the old Chicago post office. You can look at the merchandise mart. Those are filling up with corporate offices. And people want to live close to work. The king and queen. Starting first with our queen. This big building with the lights at the top, the white lights. This is 311 South Wacker. And we call her our queen because of that crown she wears on the top of her head. That crown was originally filled with 1800 fluorescent light bulbs. Those have mostly been switched out to LED bulbs, but they still have to dim the lights during certain bird migration periods. This is because the lights were so bright originally that birds were thinking 311 South Wacker was the moon. <laughs> they would fly into the moon, they would fly around the moon for hours. It wasn't a lot of fun. They have since dimmed the moon. But let me introduce you to the king of the Chicago skyline, topping out at 1,451 feet, 442 meters. The black building fading away into the fog is the tallest building in Chicago. It's the Sears Willis Tower. There we go. Can I get ooh? ooh. Ah, thank you. Built in 1974, this was the tallest building on the planet. A record it would hold for 24 years. That's a long time to hold that record. It was the tallest building in the country until 2014 when One World Trade Center was completed in New York City. But the roof of the Sears Willis Tower is 83 feet taller than the roof of One World Trade Center. How does that work out? Well, according to the Council on Tall Buildings and Urban Habitat, the height of a building is determined from your lowest open air entrance to the top of your structure, not including antennas. Since antennas serve a practical purpose, mechanical purpose, they're not included in the height. And since spires and loopholes are included in the height, they're not mechanical. That's how the Sears Willis Tower was beat. One World Trade Center has a spire. It's a source of ground sign technicality. <laughs> if you look at the Sears Willis Tower, you also notice it's not just one giant column, but a series of nine columns at varying heights. This is a technique called bundling or bundle tubes. You 
Kids, third part of our series, How to Build Tall, Tall Buildings in a Windy, Windy City. As the story goes, Dr. Fuzzler Khan was at the office late one night with his fellow chief structural engineers. They were messing around with some cigarettes for inspiration. They realized that one cigarette all by itself, pretty, pretty flimsy structure, falls right over, can't build anything on it. But they realized from bundling cigarettes at the bottom, a three by three base, slowly getting slimmer as you move to the top, you get a much stronger structure. The Sears Willis Tower was the first building to put this idea into use. The tower was able to get to such a height, they still use it today. St. Regis Tower, the first building we saw today, is bundled, slowly getting slimmer as it moves to the top. Keep your eye out for them. the Sears Willis Tower. They're about 300 feet tall, about the length of a football field. And curiously enough, Gateway Centers 1 and 2 are each about 300 feet tall. Imagine white antennas just as tall as these structures. They broadcast television signals and radio signals out from those antennas. But two people have climbed to the top of the Sears Willis Tower. An American man did so in the 80s, wearing a Spider-Man suit and using suction cuffs to get to the top <laughs> of the structure. The second man wasn't using suction cuffs. He was just French, and he climbed to the top with just his hands and feet wedging his fingers in between the glass panes as he climbed to the top of the structure. No safety gear, no safety rope. They both successfully made it to the top of the Sears Willis Tower and were both successfully arrested at the top of the Sears Willis Tower. That's, who would have guessed that's an illegal thing to do. You're not allowed to do that. Right. The American man was only fined $35 for his crimes. Seems like the city with the largest opera auditorium in North America on this right hand side. Pacific Opera Building. Another facet of this Art Deco style is to honor and elevate other cultures with its style. There's iconography from Greek, Roman, Egyptian, and Native American sources on and in this building. You can see faintly on the side inscribed Civic Opera Building, but it reads Civic Opera the Building because they're using the Latin alphabet which only has 23 letters, not including the letters U, W, or J. And B is entirely intentional, not only really expensive spelling error, spreading awareness. Just where all no. so, That's also the horn. I did get on that one, guys, to be honest. Gotta do a quick Chicago shout out to Chicago food. Since it's a Chicago tour, we gotta talk about the delicacies of this great city. First, deep dish pizza. Deep dish pizza fans here. Mm -hmm. okay. yeah. Yeah, excellent, big fans. There we go. Let me tell you about those uninitiated. So it's about two inches thick and has buttery crust, red sauce, tomato sauce on the top, and the rest of it is just cheese in the middle. About two inches of cheese. It's very tasty, very filling. Get yourself a nice pie at Giordano's or Illuminati's Italian sausage on the top there. Also make sure you get yourself a hot dog in Chicago. Make sure to get it Chicago style. This is because Chicago's motto as a city officially is herbs and horto, which means city in a garden. Chicago has a lot of parks and green spaces. That's why it has that. On the river, it's called Art on the Mart. And every night in the spring and summer, about 15 minutes after sunset, there is art and animations projected onto the side of Merchandise Mart. And what is the world's largest public display of art? It's been a favorite for locals and visitors alike. They do this program in conjunction with the Art Institute of Chicago, which is an art museum I would highly recommend you check out on your visit to our city. A lot of famous paintings there, including some Van Goghs, some Picassos, and of course that one painting from Ferris Bueller's Day Off. Oh, can't go wrong <laughs> with that one. If you happen to go and visit the Art Institute, try to find the night room. It's tucked away in the corner, and it's pretty cool. It's got dozens of suits of medieval armor just all looming at you. I love it. On this right-hand side, one round from this bridge, we're going to see the gray box where they house the $8 million projector system for art on the Mart. <laughs> it's not just one projector, it's 34 projectors all working together to create the seamless image you see on the side. Hey! Excited for art the Mart. 
going to be there. <laughs> it's lit, but you can watch Art in the Mart tonight at 9 and 9, 32 separate shows. You can watch it on the Riverwalk here or on Wacker Drive. Happens every night in the spring, summer, and fall. But while we're looking on this right-hand side, you notice these stainless steel poles sticking out of the water. These are supporting floating gardens known as fish hotels, where native fishies get no expenses paid place to stay. It's an attempt to bring native fish species back to this water. An idea given to the city by an organization called Friends of the Chicago River, which came to be after an article in this next-gen contemporary style. There's something I have to admit about this name. It's a placeholder name, Next Gen Contemporary. In about 20 years, you can go on a boat tour, and they'll tell you what the real name of this style is. Since we are living in the time period of when this building and buildings like it were built, we don't know the broader historical significance of the style, thus we're not exactly ready to name it. Styles Art Deco. They didn't call it Art Deco in the 1920s. They called it Futurism. They didn't predict the future, though. Art Deco was coined in the 1960s. Well, let's look. Popular in New York City on the East Coast. This is because Chicago likes to leave space for its buildings. There's a couple of advantages to doing this. One advantage is you're able to have alleyways to put more garbage in those alleyways. It's a nice pro to your city. Another benefit with these the space, you can just have the space, the psychological room to breathe in this downtown area. There's zoning laws in the 1960s trying to prevent such a congested city. They didn't want hallways of concrete. That's why Chicago might have more of an airy feel than some other downtown areas. Doesn't mean we don't like these buildings, though. Yeah. That blue lights building the center is London House. Has the rainbow lights at the top. It's a rooftop bar. It was voted the second best rooftop bar in the country, beating out rooftop bars in New York City and the West Coast. Offers a stunning view of this river, and it gets a great view of the skyline too. Well, let's jump across the river. On this left-hand side, we will see the Wrigley Building completed in the 1920s, as we mentioned, in this sort of lifeless style. Jump across the street from that, we will see a beige building with vertical lines in the center lit up orange. This is the Tribune Tower. Built in 1926, if the Wrigley Building is trying to copy a Spanish cathedral, the Tribune Tower is trying to copy a French cathedral. It's built in a French Gothic Revivalist style. Based off a cathedral in Normandy, France, you can look at the top Watch there and look how ornate, handcrafted, and French it looks. The Tribune Tower is actually designed from a compass tower. This is MDC Tower, and it's built in a style that is not technically Art Deco because there's a lot of vertical lines in the setback roof. It's built in 1989, making it a Echo Deco style. Echo Deco, Echo Deco. It's a lot of fun to say. It's a reference to a architectural style that is reviving those Art Deco themes with modern materials, a love letter to the Art Deco era. They have filmed Judge Mathis, Jerry Springer, and the Steve Harvey show before in this tower. And it was designed by Adrian Smith. Also designed the Burj Khalifa, the tallest building in the world. He said he's inspired by the work of Raymond Hood, who designed the Tribune Tower and also designed 30 Rockefeller Center in New York City. That would make a lot of sense. 30 Rockefeller Center is the NBC headquarters of the world. Let me tell you a little bit of the river because it was so bad and stinky and polluted. We actually have a bright future for the river. We had a mayor say they wanted to make the river swimmable. Wouldn't that be sweet? Swimming in the river and with beauty. They did say by 2040. So that is 18 years from now. So we still got a little bit of time to hang out and chill. That mayor is also out of office, come to think about it. So we might have some time before the river is fully swimmable. But 
We can still we can still look at his prettiness from our boats. That's left hand side. You'll see a black curvilinear skyscraper. This is Lake Point Tower, completed in 1969. It's the only residential building we'll see on the east side of this roadway we're about to climb under. Control drive. This is because Lake Point Tower took advantage of some zoning law loopholes. There's a lot of zoning laws put in place trying to prevent buildings on swill. This is denoting Navy Pier. Hey, that's where we put you up today. Navy Pier has had a long history. Built in 1916, originally as a shipping dock, then transitioned to a military training facility in World War II where 15,000 pilots qualified for military service. And there's actually World War II airplanes that had to crash land into Lake Michigan. If you brought your scuba gear on your visit to Chicago, you can go and check 